food is medicine, okay? And this is important to know. So one of the things that I've incorporated into my sleep medicine practice is the mito food plan. And the mito food plan is a very low glycemic, high in the phytonutrient spectrum, 20% of your calories from protein, 20% from carbs, mostly above the, the ground plants and the other 60% from, from fat. And I love this quote by Terry Walls. Our fixation on the perfect ratio of macronutrients is misguided. Instead, we should be fixed on how to maximize the vitamins, minerals, and antioxidant status from food. Very well said. So let's take a look at some components of the mito food plan. All right, almonds. Now, almonds is a monosaturated fat, nice amount of vitamin E. This can help uh, reduce free radical accumulation. Glutathione is an important antioxidant, and mitochondria have intracellular calcium as well. Avocados, you know, once again, another healthy fat, and remember, our mitochondrial membranes are made out of fat. Uh, mitochondria also have potassium channels. People say, uh, okay, I need potassium. Have a banana. No, avocados have more potassium than, than bananas. And uh, glutathione, again, mitochondria are the primary intracellular site of oxygen consumption and the major source of reactive oxygen species. So mitochondrial glutathione is a main line of defense for the maintenance of an appropriate redox environment. And then we have beef, okay? Um, not just beef. Let's say buffalo and grass-fed beef, Okay. So listening to a CD by Andrew Weil, he very, very nicely described how our hunter-gatherer um, pre precessors, you know, they didn't eat animals that were very large. They ate small animals, bushmeat, that were running for their lives. So we, the, the, our hunter-gatherers, those meats that they ate were lean. And if you think about it, if you see a wild deer, I mean, they're, they're pretty lean. So we evolved over many, many years with a ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 of 1 to 1. Omega-3, good for our brain. Omega-6 is more inflammatory. But the standard American diet with the meats that are antibiotic-filled and, and um, uh, pumped with hormones can have a, a 12 to 1 ratio of omega-6 inflammatory over omega-3. And I've heard uh, quotes of this being actually higher. Blueberries, rich in phytonutrients, they improve blood flow to the brain and they protect the neurons from free radical damage. Um, been shown to help with memory and cognition. Broccoli, I love me some broccoli. If you ever hear Dr. Reginald Roundtree, oh my God, he goes off about broccoli. Loves it. Um, Sulforaphane activates NERF2. What's NERF2? NERF2 is a basic leucine cipher that uh, regulates an expression of antioxidant proteins that protect against oxidative damage triggered by injury and inflammation, okay? They also increase glutathione, something that we've been talking about there. Coconut oil, man, this, this you know, is controversial. Now, the American Heart Association, they have come out and they have made their statement, okay? Uh, I think that it is important to know what their guidelines are, know what their statements are, and if you're going to put a patient on uh, on coconut oil, that you need to be monitoring pre and post biomarkers. Now, what you'll find is in a low carbohydrate diet, their, their biomarkers have a tendency to improve. You know, some of the studies that that they they talked about with coconut oil, yes, it increases your cholesterol when you make coconut cake. Well, uh, well, is it the coconut oil or is it the coconut cake that's doing it? So coconut oil has received bad press because it's a saturated fat, but not all fats are equal. This is a medium chain fat. Coconut oil supports your mitochondria, which is your, your energy generator. Interestingly, uh, there was a group of farmers that wanted to fatten up their cows, so they're like, ha, let's give them coconut oil. Well, you know what? Those cows lost weight. Why? Because you put them in ketosis. That's why. So... Coconut oil has been found to provide benefit to the brain from ADHD and Alzheimer's. Anytime that you're using, um, you know, coconut oil or something, cite your references and just make sure that you know your literature and, and also monitor biomarkers. Green tea is high in EGCG, which appears to have powerful antioxidant effects against uh, free radicals. Just neuroprotective, activates nerf 2 great for your mitochondria. Olive oil. 
you know, so olive oil, uh, high in polyphenols, it's anti-inflammatory. Whenever I go to a restaurant, let's say if I go to a pub, instead of uh, French fries, I say, listen, can I have some broccoli? And I ask for some olive oil and I pour that over. One of my favorite things there. Pomegranate, you know, palm wonderful, right? So they're high in antioxidants. They're anti-inflammatory. Um, they're actually low glycemic because of the seeds. They're such high in fiber and they're good for your liver as well. So one thing that you can do is you can sprinkle a little bit of pomegranate juice with club soda. And I do more club soda than pomegranate juice. You've got to be careful how much juice you're taking in because you don't want to take in too much sugar. But this is, in our house, what we call soda juice. So instead of giving a, a Coke or, or a Diet Coke or whatever, we'll have a little bit of, of soda juice. And my kids have this, and they enjoy it. And this is also something that I'll have on Sundays. So that I don't, you know, the cold ones that, that, that I put down are more uh, pomegranate and, and club soda and less of the liquid uh, carb there from beer while you watch football, right? So wild Alaskan salmon, high in DHA and omega-3, high in carotenoids. Carotenoids and ubiquinones cooperate as redox participants in an anti-radical reaction and in helping to maintain membrane stabilization during times of high energy demand. So this is important. It's a great source of coenzyme Q10 as well. So this is my, in case of emergency, break glass uh, meal where I will keep cans of wild-caught uh, salmon. And if I forgot to pack a lunch or something, I have a Publix next door that sometimes I'll, I'll get uh, arugula or watercress, and I'll just put my salmon over that, my emergency meal. Seaweed, high in minerals for mitochondria. Yes, high in selenium and magnesium, 10 times that of other vegetables. Good for your mitochondria. So these dry seaweed snacks are so much better for you than, than chips during a football game or, or at a party. Um, also, you can use some of the, the dry seaweed. that You can put that into a broth instead of um, gluten noodles. And then there's spinach, you know, so spinach is high in antioxidants. It helps improve memory, high in carotenoids. Um, flavonoids are anti-inflammatory, and they have antioxidant protection as well. You're off topic. You're talking about food plan. How does this relate to sleep? No, I'm not off topic. Protein intake, of, when it's 20% of your calories, you get the best general sleep scores, okay? And mito food plan is 20% of your calories from, from protein. Also, um, high glycemic diet load has been associated with higher depression symptoms and, and total mood disturbances and fatigue, okay? That's what my patients are seeing me for, not really for what happens at night. They come to me for what's happening in the daytime, their fatigue. Food is medicine. Fish consumption has found to have a positive effect on the impact of sleep. On a, uh, 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 sometimes that could be vitamin D related, um, but also oleic acid related. So oleic acid seems to be especially important for sleep disorders, uh, maybe due to their function as uh, precursors of, of sleep-inducing oleamide. Isn't that interesting? So... Alzheimer's disease is generally associated with lower omega-3 fatty acid uh, from fish as well. Now, I was taught neurodegeneration uh, from Alzheimer's disease occurs at the circadian level. I believe it, but there's no doubt that there's other relations that are going on. This is fascinating information. So, sleep and phytonutrients. Higher daily isoflavin intake was positively associated with optimal sleep duration and quality. This is directly related. Now, I was giving this talk to uh, an administrator and, um, you know, pointed out this evidence, and they said, yeah, but, you know, you're talking about nutrition, but you're only, you're referring to nutrition journals, and I really didn't know how to respond to that, but um, I stand, we stand by the evidence here. Lo and behold, when you have certain mitochondrial or micronutrient deficiencies, you have more insomnia as well. So here's a case that I had. Um, patient uh, was the, had some some insomnia and you know a little bit of, of fatigue. And lo and behold, we find oleic acid seems to be especially important factor for sleep disorders. And now I'm seeing a lot of this in my patients that 
that I get um, micronutrient analysis for insomnia, I'm seeing oleic acid deficiencies because we grew up to be such a fat-phobic um, uh, nutrition country here. And then there's a low carnitine and uh, asparginine as well, which has been associated with fatigue. So I'll give that information. Here's a, a different case that I have. This patient has fatigue, polycystic ovarian syndrome, some fatigue with exercise. They were already on a low-carb diet, yet still had polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, that didn't make sense to me until we got the micronutrient analysis and we found that they had low chromium. Well, that's going to affect fatigue as well. And also she had some low oleic acid, which can be seen in sleep deprivation. And then there was some serine deficiency as well that can affect uh, sports performance. So going through that. And then I had this pediatric patient, you know, that it took the, the patient some time to fall asleep, and lo and behold, they had some deficiencies, a lot of deficiencies, actually. But um, B3 and B6 are associated with insomnia. Um, copper is associated as well. Now, this kid had many deficiencies. Why? You know, he was, he was already gluten-free, but his gluten-free consisted of veggie straws, you know, so um, he wasn't taking in fruits and vegetables, rather just eating veggie straws all day long. So he wasn't taking in uh, his phytonutrients. You know what? And how you eat can inf uh, affect your, your microbiome as well. And it's been shown that uh, high palmitic acid can alter gene clock expression. And I think more studies need to be done on what type of palmitic acid. Is it organic? But we're noticing some correlations here. There's an interplay between the microbiome and the circadian clock. Um, when we're not eating healthy fats, if what we're having is, is bad fats, that can affect our microbiome. And likewise, when you disrupt your circadian rhythm, you are altering your fecal microbiota as well, your microbiome. Um, and we recognize that these clock genes regulate in all sorts of different cell types. The fundamental bioenergetic process of mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, a whole connection of oxidative stress and bioenergetics is coupled to this. So disrupted genes, disrupted my, um, mitochondria. So people are like, all right, all right, what else can I do for my mitochondria? Well, the ketogenic diet, conventional wisdom says that Mitochondria prefer glucose. However, ketones from fatty acids um, produce better energy to your brain. You know, so I, I did have a patient that, that came to me on, on a uh, ketogenic diet, and her doctor told her to come off of it, and when she did, she gained weight. Um, there's so many benefits to ketosis. The first notes of the ketogenic diet of using that were back in biblical times where they would take uh, demon-possessed people and they'd put them out in the desert. They weren't demon-possessed. They had epilepsy. You know, so uh, inducing ketosis can be good for the brain there. Cologne, you're getting off topic. No, I'm not getting off topic. The ketogenic diet improves sleep quality, and that's been seen in children with therapy-resistant epilepsy. Also, when they gave ketogenic diets to patients with cancer, why would you do that? Because cancer cells love sugar. So when you give them ketogenic diets, you improve their cancer outcomes, and they have less insomnia. Plus, you increase deep, slow-wave sleep. Also, ketogenic diets and low glycemic diets have been shown to improve mood. Narcolepsy and ketogenic diets. So I use um, ketogenic diets and narcolepsy. It's not that I use. Go and, 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 and look at the, the evidence in the literature. And there's a lot of patients with narcolepsy that are doing this on their own because they haven't been uh, instructed to do this with, by their physician. And it's basic science, folks. Narcolepsy is a disorder that you have decreased orexin neurons, okay? Orexin neurons are wake promoting. Well, what turns off orexin neurons? Sugar. High glycemic state turn off orexin neurons. So as I'm saying, this is basic science. So I, I told this to a physician and they said, well, but that's not sustainable. Why? Because it's bad for your heart? No, actually, low-carbohydrate diets have been shown to improve your overall biomarkers, and this has been uh, studied by cardiologists. All right, so what else can I do for my mitochondria? People want to know. Well, 
there's a number of different nutrients that can support your mitochondrial function, and this slide is available upon uh, request, so you can have this reference. Cologne, wait a minute. You're a sleep disorder specialist, and, and you're referencing all of these nutrient supports. You're off topic. No, I'm not. Look at this. Melatonin is one of them, okay? Um, melatonin preserves the integrity of the mitochondria and helps to maintain cell survival. That's fascinating. And it can also um, be used as potential therapeutic tool for, for underlying Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And it's part of complex one and complex four of your electron transport chain. That is fascinating. You know, to me, when I learned this, this is like when I learned that there's more planets beyond Pluto, that, there, that there's other galaxies. You know, learning that there's more aspects of of the the electron transport chain and they've been shown melatonin use has been shown to be helpful for headaches and let's remember food is medicine we can get melatonin from tart cherry juice which is also helpful for sleep and decreases inflammation as well and melatonin can be found in foods okay plant-based foods including tomatoes walnuts barley strawberry olive oil and wine let's not forget food is medicine so you have this pathway where you take in your tryptophan, you make serotonin, and then you make melatonin. So we make our own melatonin as well. And this this was fascinating when I learned that when you give probiotics that you may be improving their melatonin production. You know, so what? Probiotics? Your gut? More melatonin? Melatonin's in your brain, right? Well, that's like saying serotonin is in your brain. 10% of your body serotonin is in your brain. Other 90% is in your gut. All right, what else can I do for my mitochondria? Well, exercise. So as I was learning about the Mito Food Plan, I called up the, the NIH and I talked to their lead nutritionist that works with uh, mitochondrial disorders, and she said, you know what, your food plan, this is exactly what we're doing. We don't call it the Mito Food Plan, but this is what we're doing, inducing um, uh, uh, low glycemic diets, but the other thing that we're doing is that we're having them exercise because the exercise turns over the bad mitochondria and improves your good mitochondria. Oh, look at that. But there's a correlation there between micronutrient status and exercise. Isn't that fascinating? And then exercises increases BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. Exercise is like growth hormone for your brain. Uh, Cologne, are you off topic again? No. I'm not off topic because we talked in, in the first lecture how regular exercise can improve your sleep by increasing slow wave sleep. Wow, man, I gave you all a lot of information. Why on God's green earth would I give so much information at one time? I'll tell you why. I don't know when in my lifetime I'll ever have the ear of the talent level of, of the 500 plus people that are listening to this webinar. And I hope that you spread the word around to make it exponential. You have to understand that the definitions that we use for disorders today may not be that of tomorrow, okay? Look at this definition for sleep. Sleep is the intermediate state between wakefulness and death. Wakefulness being regarded as the active state of all the animal intellectual functions and death as their total suspension. That was from the anatomy of drunken, uh, the anatomy of drunkenness, uh, in 1834. Listen, we have to understand that when we see a disorder in our field, what we are seeing is the tip of the iceberg. And even in my field, the textbook will tell you Insomnia may be best viewed as a symptom rather than a disease process, as it often accompanies another disorder. Well, we say that in functional medicine as well. Dr. Patrick Hannaway, a uh, functional medicine physician, says functional medicine is like a root cause analysis. So, very proud to be part of this profession of physicians teaching other physicians that dates back from that of Hippocrates. And remember, he said something else. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. 